So I was thinking about this in your morning presentation, um, and you said maybe we would talk about it later, later in the week, um, but I'm not sure exactly if you're gonna cover this, so I figured, and since you brought it and shamed me publicly, then uh, Jesus. I figured I'd give it a shot. <laughs> give it a shot. Um, so uh, you, you spoke a lot about how we have these kind of, and we call it in English, sexy science terms. You know, uh, things that capture the public's attention. Uh, the, the high conservation areas based on biodiversity, but maybe perhaps not as objectively, as objective as they could be. Yet, as professional scientists and conservationists, we're getting a lot of pressure to produce these, these, this science and these numbers. And so we're oftentimes conflicted between being the objective scientist that we want to be, but also maintaining the, the career strength that we need to continue in our career. So can you, do you have any advice on how to navigate that? And, and uh, what, is there a middle line or is there no line? And I don't have a good answer. Yeah. Thanks for the challenging question. Um, I think it's a matter of doing both, which is to say we all know people who are in the policy arena who used to be scientists and have basically just jumped ship and, you know, in the case of these marketing activities, you sell your soul to the devil. You basically say, I'd rather have a $10 million donation to my NGO than real scientific rigor. You know, and you'll see people like that basically say, oh, you have new evidence. Tell me all about it, please. Because they don't want to hear. Okay? And we also all know scientists who basically say, I'm doing my science and I don't care. You know, what it becomes as far as policy, so be it. You know, but what matters to me is that next nature paper or that next whatever. And, and I think both of those are irresponsible. And I think there are people who are in both worlds. And I think you have to choose, you know, am I more in the science world with a little bit in policy? Or am I more in the policy world with a little bit in science? And so I know people at big conservation NGOs who are still active practicing responsible scientists. And I know people in academia who get into policy or get into activism. And I think that's successful if you're able to do, in some sense, both of them responsibly. Did I manage not to answer your question? Uh, no, I think that was, I think that's good. You know, I think that everybody has their own uh, personal approach to something and we all have our, our own personal values and system of ethics. But it is something that I, I have thought about a lot mm -hmm. as a scientist um, and your, your talk is kind of bringing that up again. Um, and so it's just interesting to hear from, you know, career scientists how they've navigated some of those conflicts. Uh, and I think it's important especially for early career scientists and conservationists in particular, to start thinking about these conflicts and how you might approach them as they come up, because they will come up. Um, so. What I didn't tell you about the Parks and Peril example was that it must have been maybe 1995 or 1996, I saw a request for a consultant put out by Nature Conservancy and what they wanted was somebody to come in and evaluate the parks and peril system for Mexico. And I thought, sounds like a job for me. And I'd never done consulting it before. I'm sure that my scientific credentials were better than the other proposals. I'm also sure that my proposed uh, cost was about a tenth that of the other consultants so I got the job and they flew me out to talk with them and they set the terms of reference 
and I used the money to hire a student of mine who was very capable, and the two of us put together a data set, and we basically showed, you the, showed them the result that I just showed you, which is, you know, their points, you probably saw there were a few in northwestern Mexico in these spectacular deserts, and a few in southeastern Mexico in these spectacular rainforests, and none in the heart of Mexico where you have all the unique species. And we put together this data set and uh, turned in a report that basically said that their, um, their network was fairly seriously misconceived, that it was based on aesthetic value more than biodiversity value, and even in the southeast where it had lots of species diversity, they were northern limits of species that are very well represented, for example, in Costa Rica. Same species, no major biogeographic breaks. And so we turned in this report that was just scathing. And so what they did was they said, okay, you've fulfilled the terms of the contract, we will finish paying you, and please notice clause 26 that says that we have exclusive rights to this information, so don't plan to publish this. And so that was a big dilemma for me because I could refuse the money and publish an attack on their system or I could take the money and figure out some other way to communicate that or I could just shut up. And what I ended up doing, it was pretty bad of me, I ended up taking the money it was a lot of money, it supported a student of mine. Um, I put a lot of work into it for that N N NGO. I turned in the report, and then I very deliberately deleted all the data files. I waited a couple of months, I went back, and I re-derived the data files completely independently, and published it. New data. They were, they were not the same data. <laughs> so, so, I don't know if I made the right decision. I don't know if I would do the same thing now. But, you know, you will get into these dilemmas. You know, a lot of you will have the opportunity of, oh, you have a master's degree, and you're an expert in plant diversity. We need a consultant for an en environmental impact statement and we really want you to focus on the viability of this site right here, okay? That happens all the time. You know, and what do you do? Maybe the best job as far as pay? Right? May support you for a year with a week of work or a month of work. And you're going to have your ethics challenged, you're going to have your standards shaken a little bit, and there's no good general answer. Um, I've gotten into trouble also, I do some stuff in the public health realm, and I published a paper a few years ago showing that if you look at Africa as a continent, and if you use climate trends to guess at malaria transmission into the future. As a continent, climate change is really good for reducing malaria transmission in Africa. And it's because, you see, in West Africa, there's a fairly narrow transmission band along the coast, and that all gets drier. So it gets worse for the, the, the mosquito vectors, where it gets better for the mosquito vectors is in kind of southern Africa. And precisely the places where it gets worse for the mosquitoes are the highest density of human population. And where it gets better is the lower densities of human population. And so if you, you know, I crossed my results with with census data and showed that it was a, a massive difference in numbers of people exposed to malaria on this continent. 
Of course, in a low, there's a mosquito flying right between Jesse and me. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably in Nafui's Gambia. Um, and so I got into a lot of trouble for that paper. The reviewers were like, you can't say that climate change is good. <laughs> no. All I do is I believe in data. Right? I just, I, I need reasonable indicators of a phenomenon. I need to trust each step of the process. And then whatever the data tell me. Obviously, when I saw that result, I reanalyzed the data this way and that way and this way and that way. I checked everything five times. I got the same result. So, so I don't know if that's a... No, it's very good. Yeah. You know, but it, it's the sort of thing that all of you will get into in your careers. These, these complex questions of, is this the right thing to do? Or should I put more time in the activism world versus in the basic science world? Yeah, and that's, as you said, everybody makes his or her choice. Other questions? So I want, I want to go back to the map that you had that looked at the value of biodiversity and uh -huh. the value of um, ecosystem, ecosystem services. services. And I was wondering, I know you said you didn't want to look into the paper to see how they actually valued localities for ecosystem services and biodiversity, but I was wondering if you could speak a bit to how they did that, because I think <laughs> quite relevant for this course, and I think we could argue a lot about what are the inputs that go into those categories. You all, what, what, how do you think you should value biodiversity priority? How do you measure biodiversity priority? And how do you measure um, ecosystem services values? Do, do any of you have any thoughts about this? Jesse. For me, when it comes to ecosystem service evaluation, I think the best indicators to use is you'll have to do surveys with people, with communities around these ecosystems. Then you build from that is when you quantify the various services that they, they, are, they get from the very specific ecosystems. And then the diversity priority would be, you'd have to merge a lot of species tolerance limits so you'd have to actually have information on the various values and the various species, then put them on and see how all of them are behaving as accumulative. Yeah. Other thoughts? Jesse brought up an interesting point. Thank you. The ecosystem services is that valuation a local one or is it a global one? Yep. And is the biodiversity valuation local or global? You may say Rwanda has 1,000 species of birds. I don't want to lose any one of them. But we might think about which of those are unique to Rwanda and we might give them more weight, more priority, or we might want to think of ones that are well protected in neighborhood, neighboring countries and giving those less, I don't know. But think a lot about, you know, Jesse brought up that the ecosystem services maybe should be valued locally, although carbon storage is certainly a global thing. You know, the Brazilians basically say, world, keep your nose out of the Amazon. We know it does a lot of carbon storage, but it's ours, right? Can, the question on scalability, is it good to actually look at it in terms of, can we have tools that are uniform, that each local scenario can report their data in a way that can still be able to be used to make the global data? It would be complex, but I think it could happen. You know, I mean, think about it. Where you are in northern Kenya, water conservation is absolutely crucial. 
But some of our participants from what the Congo Basin, water may not be the issue. It may be something different. <laughs> Question over here. Hold on. It was, not a, it was not really a question. Mm -hmm. uh, I was going to, to intervene for the question asked by uh, Ellen. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how do you measure biodiversity? How we do you measure ecosystem services? Um, I think it depends on the local context, uh, but uh, also it takes into consideration the global understanding of uh, the, the situation of biodiversity species. For example, um, it takes into consideration the status of a species being endemic or threatened or endangered or near threatened mm -hmm. um, to measure its value for a certain uh, ecosystem, to, to say this ecosystem needs to be uh, protected. I, we can give an example of the mountain gorillas here in Rwanda, mm -hmm. how they, they are being protected because of uh, the status of at international IUCN red list. But are, are mountain gorillas being protected because of IUCN? Because of the its status on the red list of IUCN. Huh. In the end, uh, they are reduced. They are facing so many threats. Couldn't we also build an argument that mountain gorillas are being protected rigorously by Rwanda because it's an important economic? input. I mean, what did we hear? 3%, 2% of the GDP of Rwanda is 10%. 10, 10%, 10 sorry. 3% direct, 10% indirect. I see. Okay. Yeah, this now we are going to look at in the angle of ecosystem services now of the Volcano Reserve Park, not only for the mountain yeah. areas. That's how now uh, the ecosystem services, we measure them in accordance to how, man, how much money Mm -hmm. The ecosystem is providing in the GDP of the country to value it, it is uh, it, has, it has a need to to protect it. Mm -hmm. yeah, so you see, it is in the ecosystem services. It is in terms of how much they contribute, but by diversity, it is in, in what is the status, what is the need to protect this this, this species. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, when we go out uh, with this uh, protected, international protected, internationally protected species, otherwise we are bringing new approaches to use uh, pollinators, you see, outside the protected areas in the agroecosystem. Uh, uh, those species that uh, has uh, other values like pollination, even if they are not endangered or threatened or Mm -hmm. This is another way to measure biodiversity. The end of the purpose to measure biodiversity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So everybody, think a lot about that. At what scale do you measure these different things, and in what scale are they relevant? What if we had a species? I don't know. I'm, I'm not going to pick any more species. We have a species that occurs all across Rwanda. here in the garden. It's very common. Maybe it's even a crop pest. And it's found nowhere else. Does that mean that Rwanda is going to say that species is not deserving of any protection? Yeah. And everybody else in the world would say, please, Rwanda, take good care of that species. <laughs> Right? So you could build an argument that the biodiversity, because of the, the uh, unique nature of each species, the biodiversity should have some component of global prioritization. Yeah. I mean, you referred to IUCN. I referred to IUCN, but to, we, I, I can also refer to some endemic species that we have in Rwanda, mm -hmm. that like, I know one, one species of sunbird mm -hmm. in the National Park. Mm -hmm. So it is, it is conserved because it is unique to Rwanda. Ah, okay. 
Anyhow, these are, these are interesting questions. They're challenging questions. Okay? You basically have to do biodiversity conservation locally because if the local people aren't involved, it's not going to be successful. You have to do at least some of the prioritization globally. And there probably should be national, subnational, and local prioritization as well. And they, they may agree. I mean, probably all of those prioritizations would say preserve mountain gorillas. But in other cases, there'll probably be pretty serious disagreements. Sure. Uh, another example of is um, uh, the, the prioritization of uh, wetlands of uh, international concern. Mm -hmm. Those that protect are protected by Ramsar. Mm -hmm. At the global level, at the also national level, but also at the local level. Um, so they, they are now they are now an ecosystem. It is not a, a simple a, a small species. It is an ecosystem that this 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 time I can classify it as um, now how how the, the reason to measure ecosystem services. Mm -hmm. uh, the TCA yesterday gave an example of Rogesi wetlands, which is providing uh, water and regulating hydro 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 hydro, hydro, hydro power. Mm -hmm. Directly production in Rwanda, but there are also other other wetlands in Rwanda that are listed, mm -hmm. proposed to become also protected at the global level, but which are not yet accepted. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. we are still gathering information on that. Sure. Yep. Okay. Other comments? Okay. Uh, I was just uh, reading your point on the conservation practice being skill dependent. Uh, uh, there is this likely example in Ghana of this plant, uh, Tabotella gentile, is uh, endemic to Ghana and uh, is also critically endangered. But uh, it's known on the IUCN rating and globally everybody knows about it. But the country itself doesn't prioritize conserving it. Mm -hmm. The local people as well. It also made very good charcoal. So, uh, the local people see don't see the need to uh, not get money or value from it and as a country no one is prioritizing it generally as a concern for the politicians mm -hmm. so these are problems and issues that you always think about and you you have issues about but you don't know how to solve it just like what uh, she's working on supplies uh, but uh, you also have it uh, at uh, yeah, in Ghana, uh, there is this uh, restricted location that we have some of these plants that are almost endangered, but no one cares about them, and the local people use them. Mm -hmm. So, prioritizing them on the uh, global scale is important, but how to integrate it on the national and the local scale mm -hmm. is a real big problem. And notice that prioritizing on the global scale is not enough. Yes. You can say, this is red list, this is critical. This. Hey. And if there isn't the national, regional, and local mm -hmm. yes. buy-in, it won't be successful. 